Let's work a few problems related to two-pole filters. In the first example, we're going to be designing a two-pole series-fed bandpass filter. It's mentioned here in the problem that there's no source impedance. This means that we can go ahead and draw our prototype circuit. There's our source, there's our load, and in between the two dotted lines is going to be our filter. It's going to be a series-fed bandpass filter with only two poles, so there aren't very many choices here. I can either draw the inductor first, followed by the capacitor, or I could have drawn the capacitor first. It wouldn't make any difference. If we look at the circuit that I've just drawn, we see a source, an inductor, a capacitor, and a resistor all in series. This is a circuit that we've analyzed before. When we analyzed the circuit before, it was the resistor that came first, followed by the inductor and then the capacitor. The order doesn't really matter here because the current's going to be the same through all of the elements, since they're wired in series. In our circuit, the resistor is going to be serving as the load, so we can use the equation that we've already derived. That is, we know what the load voltage is going to be relative to the input voltage at the source. We found a formula in terms of R, L, and C, but we've also found a formula in terms of Q and omega naught. Q and omega naught were defined over here on the left. Let's take those definitions and apply them to our current problem. We're told that the 3dB bandwidth is 0.1 hertz. Let's label that as delta F. We're also told that the corner frequency is 1 hertz. Let's label that as F naught. Since we know both the bandwidth and the corner frequency, we can calculate the quality factor Q. Using the 3 dB bandwidth and the corner frequency, we found that the quality factor is 10. We have an equation here that relates the quality factor to R, L, and C. So this is also 10. The problem also tells us that the corner frequency is 1 hertz. Therefore, 2 pi times 1 hertz is just omega naught. Let's square both sides of this equation. We have now an equation relating L to C. We're told in the problem that the load is 100 ohms. So in my equation for Q, I effectively have another relationship between L and C. Let's again square both sides of this equation. I have a clear relationship between L and C. So let's substitute this inductance L into my equation over here. Solving this equation for C, I find that the capacitor is 159 microfarads. I can then very easily determine that the inductor is 159 henrys. Take a look at the size of these components. They're both really large, especially the inductor. Why are the values so large? Well, if we look back in the problem, we see that the corner frequency was only one hertz. That's a really low frequency. And generally, low frequencies result in big components. Let's now see what happens if we make a small change. In part B, we're going to reduce the load to 50 ohms. How can we fix the filter? You see, if we don't do anything, then the corner frequency of the filter will be okay, but the quality factor Q is going to change because R has changed. How can we fix it? Since we're not allowed to change L and C in this circuit, I'm going to do the simplest possible fix. I'm going to just add a resistor to it. I'm going to add a 50 ohm resistor in series with the filter. You see, now the entire circuit looks just like it did before. The filter still sees a 100 ohm load, just like it did in part A, but the actual load is still only 50 ohms. What would I do though if the load were increased rather than decreased? I can't add a resistor in order to make a resistance smaller. Here, the load's going to get bigger. What should I do in order to fix the problem? We're again assuming that the inductance is still 159 henrys and the capacitance is still 159 microfarads. I certainly can't add another resistor in series with the 200 ohm load because that would just make the resistance larger rather than smaller. So what can I do in order to make the resistance come down? Well, my strategy is going to be to add a resistor in shunt rather than in series. If I add a 200 ohm shunt resistor here in parallel with my load, the net resistance is just going to go down. Since they're both 200 ohm resistors, the combined resistance of these two in parallel is just going to be 100 ohms, and that's what we had in part A. Therefore, from the filter's perspective, the quality factor is going to be the same as it was before. As far as I know, this is the simplest possible fix. In example two, we're given a circuit that's also a two-pole filter, but it's a little bit different than it was in question one. The circuit components are not all in series, and look at where the output voltage is measured. It's measured across the load resistor, but the load resistor is not appearing in its usual position. We're going to be finding the transfer function, 
identifying the filter type, and then we'll see what happens to the filter's corner frequency if we make various changes to elements inside the circuit. First of all, we can identify by inspection that this is very likely a two-pole filter. The reason I know it's a two-pole filter is because we have two reactive elements in the filter, one inductor and one capacitor. Let's go ahead and find the transfer function. The transfer function is just the output voltage divided by the input voltage. So we can use voltage division. The load voltage is measured across both a resistor and an inductor in parallel. Therefore, in the numerator, we have RL in parallel with SL. SL is just the impedance of the inductor. In the denominator, we have the impedance of the entire circuit. The resistor-inductor combination is just in series with the source impedance and with the capacitor. First, let's expand out these elements that are in parallel with one another. Let's now multiply everything in this fraction by SL plus R sub L. In the numerator, it just cancels. In the denominator, it only cancels in the first term. Let's now multiply everything in this fraction by SC. I can see here in the denominator that we have two terms of S squared. I'm now going to divide everything in this fraction by what I have circled in order to isolate the S squared in the denominator. I now have my transfer function in standard form. From the form of the transfer function, we can identify the filter type. We can see that this filter has two zeros and two poles. Both of the zeros are at the origin because if I set the numerator equal to zero, I find that there are two solutions of S equals zero. In the denominator, I can see that there are two poles because this says S squared, but I also know that these two poles will be imaginary. This is thus a high pass filter. If we go back for a moment to our equations for the simple LRC filter and look at the high pass line, that is this equation, we can see with the S squared isolated in the denominator, we have omega naught squared sitting by itself and omega naught over Q in the position in front of the S. Since our transfer function is in the same form, we can identify the omega naught and the Q from our transfer function. By comparison, this is just omega naught squared. By comparison, this is omega naught over Q. You might not always be able to make such a comparison. All two-pole filters will have this sort of form, but once you get into higher order filters, then you're not always going to be able to identify omega naught and Q just by looking at the equation. We can do it here though, because the transfer function has exactly the same form. Let me rewrite the equation for omega naught squared. I'm going to divide everything in the expression for omega naught squared by R sub L. I've done that so that the R sub L will only appear once in the equation rather than twice. That way, when I look at question C here, if R sub L is decreased, it's easier to see what effect it'll have on the corner frequency. If R sub L goes down, the expression as a whole, RS over RL, is going to increase. If the denominator like this increases, it means omega naught is going to go down. What about R sub S if we look at question D? If R sub S is increased, the denominator here is going to get larger and the expression as a whole is going to be reduced. It's going to have the same effect. In example three, we're presented with two more two-pole filters. The only difference between these two circuits is that one has a load resistor and one doesn't have a load resistor. What effect is that going to have on the corner frequency and the quality factor? That's what we're going to be looking at in example three. Let's start with the transfer function. We can use voltage division. There's the impedance of the inductor, and there's the impedance of the inductor and capacitor in series. I can multiply everything in this fraction by SC. I typically want to isolate S squared in the denominator, so I'm going to go ahead and divide everything by LC. Before we proceed to the pole zero diagrams, let's find the transfer function for circuit B. I can again use voltage division. The only difference is that we have the inductor in parallel with the resistor, whereas before we only had the inductor. Let's expand out this SL in parallel with R and then multiply everything in the resulting fraction by SL plus R. To finish the job, we need to multiply everything times SC. Then to isolate S squared in the denominator, we need to divide everything by LRC. This expression for the transfer function is in standard form. We can see that this is a high pass filter because it has two zeros at the origin and two poles. 
since the denominator here is in standard form, I can identify omega naught over Q and omega naught squared. We can do the same thing for circuit A. Omega naught squared is just one over LC. It's the same in both of these circuits. But how about the omega naught over Q? You can see that we don't have an S term in the denominator of the transfer function for circuit A. That means that omega naught over Q equals zero. Since we know that omega naught is just the square root of one over LC, the only way for this fraction to turn out to be zero is for Q to be infinite. Let's draw the pole zero diagrams to finish up the example here. A pole zero diagram is just a plot of the S plane. Each pole or zero is an imaginary number that lies somewhere in this plane. For the circuit on the left, we have two zeros, both at the origin. For the circuit on the right, we also have two zeros, both at the origin. To find the pole positions, we need to look at the denominator. Let's set the denominator equal to zero and solve for S. We find that there are two imaginary poles. There's no real component. Furthermore, we see that the distance of the pole from the origin is the square root of one over LC. That's true for the other pole as well. We can then conclude that the distance of the poles from the origin just corresponds to the omega naught, or the resonant frequency. Why are the poles along the imaginary axis, and what does that say about this circuit? Well, it means that the circuit doesn't have any loss. If the circuit had used up energy, burned up energy, say in a resistor, then the pole positions would have been in the left half plane. But because the pole positions are right on the imaginary axis, I can see from the pole zero diagram that there must not be any resistor in this circuit. It's a pure resonator. It doesn't burn power. If we look at the circuit on the right, we see that it does have a resistor. Therefore, it burns up power. The pole positions are not going to be along the imaginary axis, but are going to be shifted left. We can see that both of these circuits are essentially high pass filters. I know that they're high pass filters because they have two zeros right at the origin and they have two complex poles.